All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for today's Spotlight Series Aerospace Mechanical Engineering uh, Program or Department Offerings uh, with Professor Paul Ronnie. My name is Erin Tanaka, and I represent the Viterbi Admission and Student Engagement Office within the Viterbi School of Engineering. So I'm very excited to have Professor Ronnie join us today to talk all about the Aerospace Mechanical Engineering Program. One quick note, you will receive a PDF copy of today's presentation within a couple of business days. So, um, you know, there are quite a few links, especially towards the end of the session, so no need to jot those down unless you need them right away. In addition, throughout this session, feel free to ask questions using the Q&A panel, so just make sure you type those in. My colleague, Megan Balding, as well as um, Chrissy Franks is available online. Chrissy is representing the Aerospace Mechanical Engineering Department. She is our academic advisor. And Megan Balding is representing the Viterbi Admission and Student Engagement Office, so she can help answer questions um, that we won't necessarily be able to get to during the Q&A session or a little bit more personalized. So we'll go ahead and get started. So today's program, I'll start out by briefly talking about the University of Southern California also discuss the Viterbi School of Engineering, provide an overview, and then we will jump into the focus of today's presentation, which is going to be our Aerospace Mechanical Engineering Department offerings, so our master's degree program. And of course, um, Professor Ronnie will be able to talk about the programs. Um, I will then discuss the application criteria, and um, we'll also discuss, I'll also be discussing our online Den of Viterbi delivery method and how that works. We'll also talk briefly about tuition and fees. And then finally, at the end of the session, you will have the opportunity to ask additional questions from Professor Ronnie that you were not able to um, get answered during the session. But we will hold off all of the questions until the um, Q&A session. So for those of you that have not been to USC's campus in the past, just some snapshots of our beautiful campus. and a little bit about the University of Southern California. So we are the oldest private university in the Western United States. We were founded way back in 1880. We currently have over 47,000 students. Our graduate student population being uh, well outnumbering our undergraduate student population. And we have almost over 4,400 full-time faculty members that um, don't even include many of our adjunct faculty that come from a variety of different um, areas and fields and various industries. We have a very diverse student population. So we have students from all over the nation and all over the world um, representing multiple countries. And we are located in Los Angeles. So if you're not familiar with Los Angeles, we are about a 10 to 15 minute drive from the downtown Los Angeles area. So we really are in the middle of all the action. But there are, of course, engineering opportunities and computer science-related um, jobs and internships as well, amongst many other exciting and different things in the Los Angeles area. So specifically about the Viterbi School of Engineering. So we are one of the largest and oldest schools within USC. We are comprised of eight academic departments. Our student population, so as you can see there, we have almost 6,200 graduate students, and that includes both our master's students, both online and on campus, as well as our PhD students. And we are a leader in funded research. I will talk a little bit more about um, research in a bit. And our faculty members, we have 191 tenure track faculty members, um, 30 of which are National Academy of Engineering members. Of course, I will be focusing on Professor Ronnie today, um, who has won a number of awards as well. Um, so we will get to talking about Professor Ronnie soon. In terms of the rankings, so, you know, we know the rankings aren't everything, but we do have students that ask us from time to time where we're ranked. So in terms of best engineering graduate schools, we are a top 10 ranked graduate engineering program. In the online arena, we have been consistently ranked the number one online graduate computer science program for the eighth year in a row. And in addition, we also have been consistently ranked a top ranked online graduate engineering program. And that spans all 40 over 40 programs that we have. And the same also applies for our best um, online graduate engineering programs for veterans. So I did see a couple of you that were um, that active, active duty 
uh, military or veterans, so this may be of interest to you, but we're also ranked number one for our online graduate computer science program for veterans, as well as a top ranked online graduate engineering program for veterans. So in addition, we have some key points of distinction. So we have a very international reputation for excellence. So what that means is uh, we have not only students from all, all over the world, but we have partnerships and um, a variety of different relationships with corporations, as well as a number of other um, government institutions. Um, so really when you graduate from USC, and specifically with the Viterbi School of Engineering uh, degree, your, your, um, your degree really has value beyond the U.S. And in addition, um, if you haven't heard already, we are a part of what's called the Trojan Family Network. And so as the Viterbi School, we have over 77,000 engineers um, that have that are alumni, so um, graduated both long time ago as well as recently. And time and time again, we find you know Trojans helping one another out, and it's a great uh, perk and way to connect and network with others. And we have all types of engineering programs available, everything from our bachelor's to our doctorate programs. We also have short courses and custom programs, which fall under our executive education. Um, arm with our non-degree, so we also encourage you to check out those offerings as well. So as I mentioned before, we are a leader in funded research, so we have actually over 35 research centers and a variety of different areas of research, everything spanning from artificial intelligence or AI, uh, robotics, you know, to vision sciences, of course, a number of different areas within aerospace mechanical engineering, which um, Paul can discuss later on if you're interested in research. Um, and we do have a number of industrial partnerships and collaboration that really do support other research efforts. But now I'd like to introduce you to Professor Paul Ronnie himself. So Professor Rani is the professor and chairman of the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from UC Berkeley, um, a Master of Science in Aeronautics from Caltech, and his doctorate in Aer Aeronautics and Astronautics from MIT. So lots of um, fantastic um, educational background, but in terms of his professional background, he has experiments flown on three space shuttle missions. He's published over 80 technical pepper papers in peer-reviewed journals, made over 250 technical presentations, and holds seven U.S. patents. He also is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers um, and in the Combustion Institute, and also he's associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Um, so with that being said, I just wanted to um, hand it over to Professor Ronnie, who will be able to discuss um, a little bit about aerospace mechanical engineering. Professor Ronnie? All right, thank you. And I'm um, sorry you can't uh, see me. I guess you can only hear me. Um, let's see, I actually uh, wanted to introduce you, but of course I can't because you can't see him, introduce you to my executive vice chairman. Uh, his name is Cavalier. He's a Gypsy Vanderhorst. I do most of my, uh, most of my meetings and most of my classes uh, from the barn here. And unfortunately now you can't see that. Um, I think the problem is that pro apparently uh, WebEx was not designed by USC uh, engineers. It must have been designed by, you know, that other school or one of those other schools. Anyway, just yeah. <laughs> not going to name names here. Any case, uh, to get on to AME since uh, we're running low on time. Um, but so we have a number of research themes within the aerospace mechanical engineering department. One thrust area, no pun intended, is aerospace systems and technologies. We have a, a junior faculty member who's uh, who's very big in the area of sort of combined propulsion and aerodynamics in one vehicle, as opposed to having just engines hanging off of wings, and that leads to a lot of efficiency improvements. Uh, we have a number of faculty working in the area of what we call biodynamical engineering. We have people working on sort of uh, cancer, uh, um, basically cancer genetics. You don't think of that as being as something that occurs in mechanical engineering, but a lot of the sort of patterns that we have in mechanical engineering that also translates over to biodynamical systems. We have one new faculty member, Nima Palavan, who just uh, won an American Heart Association Career Award, uh, who studies blood flow uh, and uh, in the heart 
and also looking at ways of um, diagnosing the behavior of what's happening in the heart without having to, you know, inject anything into the heart or even image or just uh, image it just from the outside, just from the signals, just from the um, just from the echoes of the blood flow within the heart can tell you a lot about how the heart is functioning. My particular field is combustion. You know how a lot of kids go through the stage where they like to make things burn or explode? Well, I never really grew out of that, and now I get to make a living doing that. Uh, so in addition to several fact that work in the area of combustion, um, as well as fuel cells, we also have some faculty working on alternative energy. Uh, I mentioned fuel cells, also wind turbines, and uh, even a little bit in the area of, um, of uh, um, uh, bacterial fuel cells. And we also have a growing group in the area of uh, robotics and dynamics of control and manufacturing, and we have a whole center for um, advanced manufacturing, which includes uh, robotics. And uh, we have one new faculty member whose uh, claim to fame is uh, uh, basically jumping robots. You've probably seen some of his videos uh, uh, in the popular media of robots, you know, jumping onto tables or doing backflips and such. Well, he's one of the uh, one of the leaders in that area. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And it, just in terms of numbers, we have 24 tenure track faculty and a number of faculty joint appointments and a number of teaching um, faculty. As you can see, we have on the order of a little over 100 undergraduates uh, per academic year, and we have a, several hundred, about 400 um, graduate students, of which about 100 are PhD students and somewhere on the order of $24 million of, uh, of research funding. And we have a number of very successful student groups, particularly our um, AIA, that's American Society, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Every year there's a design competition where there's a different set of specifications every year and the student team has to design and build and then fly, competing against other uh, teams from other universities, uh, fly off. Um, at uh, usually either in Kansas or in Arizona. Of course, this past year we didn't have it because of COVID. And our team has been very successful in the past uh, six years. I think we've come in first three times and I don't think we've ever been below third or maybe maybe one time it was fifth. Uh, we also have um, a team, the Formula SA race car team. Again, it's the same sort of idea. Every year the specifications are different in terms of what the course is like, what the requirements for the engine and suspension are, and you have to build a vehicle from scratch. And while we don't, you know, to be honest, we don't compete uh, successfully against teams from like University of Michigan or something like that, which has, you know, many teams with enormous corporate sponsorship. I think considering, you know, that we're a smaller school, we're not plugged in as well to the automotive industry as obviously uh, the universities in Michigan are, but still we do extremely well. And in fact, we've uh, won some of the uh, um, regional competitions there. And we have also the recumbent vehicle team that's been very successful uh, in their competitions. Okay, let's move on. So we have a number of uh, master's programs. Uh, and with, you know, obviously I'm not going to go through all the details, but there's just sort of the generic uh, masters in aerospace engineering or mechanical engineering. And then you see we have a number of specialties that you can have, and we're, I think, particularly strong in uh, computational fluid and solid mechanics, uh, energy conversion, dynamics control, and then we have even a few dual degree programs. All right, next. I wish you could see Cavalier. He's, wa he's watching very intently. Um, so the requirements for the master's degree in either aerospace or mechanical engineering, there's basically one applied math course, and then the other courses, which would be well, most of the courses are four units and you need uh, 27 units. So basically it's seven courses at four units each. So basically it's one math course plus six other courses. You don't have to pick a specialty, but I think most students do because they're interested in extending their undergraduate education into one particular specialty. And we have a number of those. Uh, I think maybe for the sake of time, I won't go through those uh, individually. Okay, next. And again, similarly, we have 
uh, you can either get your master's in aerospace or mechanical engineering. And again, there's the optional uh, specializations. Okay, next. And then this just shows all the fine grain detail about for some of the, um, you know, for some of the specialties, like in this case, computational fluid and solid mechanics, uh, there's a set of required core classes uh, plus a number of elective classes that you can pick, and then you'll get your degree, Master of Science in Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering with this particular emphasis as printed either on your diploma or, uh, or in your transcript. Okay, next. And again, I think I'll skip over these. Again, this is just showing for the different programs what the uh, uh, detailed course requirements are. Okay, next. Again, same thing. Um, next. Okay, next. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so one question that I always get asked is, you know, where do our students go? What do they do after they graduate? Some of this is, you know, for master's students. I will say that in addition to what's in these slides here, um, you know, some students, not all and not a lot, but some students are interested in going on for a PhD. And actually we recruit a lot of our PhD students out of our master's classes. That's typically a good way for them to get to know us and for us to get to know them and see where there's a match. And I've, I think all the faculty have had a number of very outstanding PhD students who started out as master's students. And other PhD students come in directly, uh, apply directly from undergraduate or from a master's degree at another school apply into our PhD program. Okay, next. Okay, next please. All right, perfect. So <clears throat> thank you so much, um, oh, wait, Paul. Wait, wait, for... you, uh, you, okay. you, you skipped one. You skipped one. Oh, uh, this one? Yeah. Going back. This one? Sorry yeah. about that. Okay. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to say that, you know, here are some of the uh, industry or some of the um, companies that our students have gone to work for. I mentioned the aerospace companies, uh, a number of government labs such as Jet Propulsion Lab or Vandenberg Edwards Air Force Base, NASA. Um, some actually do go into either the financial or legal industry. In fact, I think my two top students ever in terms of students who were in several of my classes and just blew the top off the curve in all the classes of mine they were in. I can think of two right offhand, and both of them became patent lawyers. Uh, so that's one, you know, maybe it's not what we would prefer. I'd like to see them go into something more academic, but they've been extremely successful uh, in their legal careers, and I, I wish them all the best for that. And I say some of them go on to PhD programs at other universities or stay with us. Okay, next. Okay, well, thanks so much for that insight, um, Professor Ronnie. And um, I see that there are a number of questions that are coming in, which is great. And we will be discussing those questions during the Q&A session within a few slides. But I first wanted to discuss the application criteria for our master's degree programs um, within aerospace and mechanical engineering. So an undergraduate degree in engineering, math, or hard science from a regionally accredited university is required so during the application process, you would submit a copy of your official transcript that you would upload. And to be competitive, although it's not required, we do recommend at least a 3.0 and a 4.0 scale. Um, again, it's not required, but if you have less than a 3.0 GPA, you may want to really focus on other elements of your application. Um, one update that we have as of September 30th is that due to the challenges that applicants may face in taking the GRE exam, the GRE will not be required for the summer and fall 2021 applications to our Viterbi School uh, graduate programs. So that, again, just only applies up until fall 2021. And also for those that may be watching during this recorded session in, in the future, I um, just wanted to note that it's always important to refer to the, um, to the links um, that are provided within here to ensure that you have the most up-to-date information. In addition to um, other, so the official transcript, 
We also have the resume and CV that's also required, as well as a personal statement. The area that will depend the most, depending on the program, is going to be letters of, rec of recommendation. So in the individual programs, it's important that you look at their specific page because you will then see, you know, some of them are optional, others it could be required. So it is important to refer to that specific program. An additional, in addition, if you are an international student, um, the TOEFL may be required depending on um, also your academic background and where you pursued a program from as well. In terms of application deadlines, so for spring 2021, the application deadline has passed. Um, however, if you are pursuing your program online, uh, completely online via Den of Viterbi, um, we can offer some flexibility. So we do encourage you to reach out to us at denofviterbi.usc.edu if you need some additional time. Um, but for the other upcoming deadlines, fall 2021, uh, which starts in August of next year, is going to be the deadline is January 15th. And there's there's also the scholarship consideration deadline, and this is for on-campus applicants, those that plan to pursue their program on campus. Eventually, um, the deadline is going to be December 15th, um, and then you can also see the deadlines there for spring 2022. In terms of your course delivery methods, so you really have two options. So we have our on-campus and often, most often times students that are on campus tend to go full time. Um, they take two, sometimes three, maybe even more classes per semester um, and are completing their degree in about one and a half to two years. Um, we also, however, have our online Den of Viterbi delivery method, and this allows our students um, the flexibility. So many of our working professional students or just those that want to pursue their program from pretty much anywhere in the world um, have been able to do so. And so the students um, that pursue their program online, because a large majority of them are working full time, they do tend to take one to two classes per semester, and on average are graduating about two and a half to three years. But as long as you complete your degree within five years with ability to petition for additional two years, um, there can be flexibility in terms of the duration and timing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how our online Den of Viterbi delivery method works. I'm um, realizing that there's a lot of different types of online delivery out there, especially in our current situation. But, you know, USC Viterbi has had a very long standing path of delivering distance education all the way back to 19, 1972 before, you know, the online arena was available. And so, um, but, you know, we today offer over 40 programs completely online. And um, the way that it works is we have a um, proprietary web-based delivery system that provides um, flexibility to any student that wants to pursue their program online. And they can watch the lectures live as they happen on a normal basis on USC's campus. Um, that would enable you to, you know, ask your questions via phone or via chat during the session. You can also watch the lectures on your own time. So, um, you know, if you have work schedules that may not um, be aligned with the, the um, course schedule, then you can watch the lectures, you know, at your convenience. In addition, you also have the possibility or the uh, a capability once campus is back open to come on USC's campus. And um, you would be able to sit in on lectures and access all of the same resources that, you know, on-campus students have. Um, in addition, you know, we do have a, an ex entire Den of Viterbi support team that assists our students in a number of ways. So, for example, if you um, are located outside of the Los Angeles, Orange, or Ventura counties and, um, you know, you need to take your exam, which, you know, all of our students will do, um, then we have a, a dedicated Den of Viterbi exam proctor office. Um, they help assist students in finding a proctor location if needed, but, you know, oftentimes our students don't have too many issues with that because there's a variety of different options for them in terms terms of uh, where they can take their exams remotely. This also gives you a behind the scenes look at just, you know, what a typical Den of Viterbi classroom looks like. So this is the vantage point of the camera operator who is connected to our Den of Viterbi network control team who, again, you know, fully support our, our, our online students. They ensure that what you see in the classroom, it, it, you can see that, um, you could also hear everything and really are your eyes and ears and advocate for you as an online student. 
some additional information. So we also have the enrollment option, which is called limited status, which allows strong candidates with undergrad degree in engineering, math, or arts, science from a regionally accredited university or institution with at least a 3.0 and a 4.0 scale um, to be able to get a jump start in taking courses before applying for formal admission. Um, but there's a maximum of 12 units you can take as a limited status student, and you would still need to formally apply for formal admission if you'd like to do so, um, because limited status does not guarantee formal admission. We also have what's called the Employment Reimbursement Deferment Program. This is great if your company pays, uh, you know, uh, or provides tuition assistance to you. And what you can do is um, you can actually defer your upfront payment of up to 90% of your tuition until after the semester is over. So if this information applies to you, um, you know, you will want to go to the links provided there, and I will send a copy of today's session with the um, with the presentation, so you have access to these links. Um, in addition, this is our tu current tuition structure. So more information about tuition as well as fees can be found at the link provided there. So in terms of getting started, we do encourage you to go to our website if you haven't already. There's a number of different events that we have, um, as alternatives coming to on campus for a tour. Um, you can also start your application for formal admission. Um, in terms of our online denim interview students, also of course, you know, visit us at our website. Um, start with your formal application or get started as a limited status student and complete your denim interview profile for access. But now I just wanted to take the time to allow, there are a number of questions that came up. So we're gonna go ahead and do a quick Q&A session um, with Professor Ronnie. So the first question that I see is, so I'm currently pursuing a graduate certificate in robotics engineering um, with interest mostly in autonomous vehicles and control. I was wondering which program might be best suited for me uh, that could provide a combination of hardware as well as um, robotics. So I don't know, um, Professor Ronnie, if there may be a, a program that could be related that you might recommend. Well, yeah, certainly. That uh, we have an entire what's called Center for Advanced Manufacturing, but it also includes robotics. That's under Professor S. K. Gupta, you know, a very distinguished senior professor. We also have a uh, junior uh, professor, Kwan Nguyen, who I mentioned does jumping robots and, you know, are teaching, you know, several courses in that area. So I would think those faculty and the courses that they teach would probably be most appropriate for a student with those interests. Great. Thank you for that. Um, another question is, what is the difference between pursuing an MS in aerospace engineering with a specialization versus pursuing an MS in aerospace and um, with an ME with a specialization? Yeah, great question. It's really up to the individual. There's in terms of, um, in terms of the requirements, I mean, you saw what the base requirements were as well as the specialization requirements, but it's not necessary to pursue any particular specialization. So it's really uh, sort of up to the individual student to decide what courses would be most appropriate depending on their, you know, on their career plans. So I would say meet with a faculty member or staff, you know, in, in your area of uh, interest or just even the staff member like uh, Chrissy and, you know, just ask them about what would be the appropriate courses for that, what would be the appropriate degree in terms of we're fairly agnostic in terms of, you know, mechanical engineering versus aerospace engineering degrees, it's really a matter, you know, to us it's more a matter of which courses are you most interested in taking. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, are, um, are um, master's students, are, uh, are they allowed or able to um, conduct research or do any research assistantships? Uh, the answer to the first question is absolutely. The second part of the question, generally not. That is, uh, master's students, you know, do very frequently participate in research. I have had many, many over the years. As, as I mentioned, I've recruited some of my best PhD students out of the master's classes, and probably now I have, I don't know, I have to count half a dozen or so master's students doing research in my lab. Generally, 
Uh, master's students are not eligible for research assistantships. That's only for PhD students. Now, research assistantship means that you're uh, paid, you know, a stipend plus your tuition is also covered. Uh, but of course, because of, you know, the financial situation there, those are much more, admission to that program is much more competitive than that for master's students. And, but on the other hand, again, you get, basically we uh, commit to supporting you uh, for four full years, including summers, if you're admitted as a PhD student. But having said that, you can still do the research and in many cases be paid like on an hourly basis uh, for research that you do uh, with a faculty member. You're just not eligible in general for the research assistantships. Perfect. And, you know, related to thesis, so I do have another question here is if you wish, um, if they were, were to pursue a, th a thesis for their master's program, mm -hmm. you know, is that something that is required for you to be an on-campus student, or can you do that as a dormitory student as well? I would think, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. But I see no okay, reason. I can that 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 <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let, let me just say well, let me just say one yeah, thing first. That uh, I would think for you know many of our faculty who do computational work, I wouldn't think that would be a problem. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. if you're doing experimental work, you have to be on campus. Anyway, I'm sure you can add something to that, Megan. Yeah. So in terms of the thesis, and um, so you know, all of our students have the ability to pursue a thesis option. So you don't have to be um, on campus to do that. Um, but uh, also speaking to another part of your your question is that you know, um, if can then students switch to being on campus students? And the answer is that that yes, they can. Um, however, it is um, a couple things to note. So you know, our as I mentioned earlier, our, our Geneva Turby online students do have the ability to be to come to campus so they have that option to, to come to campus and sit on lectures too so oftentimes students don't choose to switch because they also want the flexibility to remain um, have access to the online um, live lectures also the course recordings as well and and so you know oftentimes that's that's not needed in order to do that um, Additionally, too, um, for those of you that may require a student visa, if you require a student visa at any point in the duration of your program, you do need to actually pursue your program on campus. So that's a, a situation in which, you know, you wouldn't be able to switch between the two because you do need to, um, to pursue your program as an on-campus student if you require a student visa. Uh, let's see. You know, let me, let me add just one more thing. Sure. Let me just add one more thing to that. Not many students do uh, pursue a master's degree with thesis. Most just do the coursework. Uh, but there's nothing that says that you can't do the uh, the master's with thesis. It's just not a common um, approach. It's really, I would say, this the type of student who would pursue that uh, approach is one who really wants to get involved in research, but for whatever reason, either the time or the, you know, the, it's really a time commitment doesn't want to pursue a full PhD program. And so I have had a number of students, you know, that do that, but like I say, it's, it's by far not the most common approach. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great point, and thank you for adding that. Um, I have another one here. Um, so, you know, there's a few years of work history in between a, a bachelor's science and master's science degree make a difference in terms of, you know, um, a student's success as an applicant and, and you know, um, adding to, you know, the possibility of um, them being a, a great candidate. Okay, and that's, that's the first that part you of it. Can, yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, does the few, essentially the, the bigger question here is, you know, does work experience really matter mm -hmm. um, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, um, the application process and, and if a, a candidate is um, considered stronger or not for mm -hmm. that then? Well, I guess I can't necessarily speak to the admissions aspect, mm -hmm. uh, so I'll, I'll let you speak to that. But I right. would say that in terms of does it help, does it help you, you know, in the master's program itself, academically speaking? And I would say for the most part, no. I would say that, you know, I think it's better if you really want to get a master's degree personally. I think it's better just to blast through and do it. I didn't say the same thing mm -hmm. about a PhD, for the same reason that, you know, how often do you hear an athlete say, you know, I think I'm going to take a few years off to work and then come back to my sport. 
I mean, it just doesn't happen, right? You know, so you want to you want to keep pursuing when you're in top shape, uh, academically <laughs> speaking. You really want to pursue that. Now, I know for some people that's not an option because you know you need to take the time off to work to earn some pay, or you know maybe to go into the military or do something for a family, mm-hmm. whatever. But I would say if you have that as an option, I would say just just go right through and do it, and then go to work. Right. Okay, so another question actually related to military is, so I recently left active duty as a nuclear engineer within the U.S. Navy. I was curious about the um, mechanical engineering and energy conversion program, particularly if USC does any research in nuclear power energy systems. Great question. Yeah, great. Uh, First of all, thank you for your service to our country. I was on the USS San Francisco for a day. It was was quite an eye-opening experience for me. We went out into the... uh, went out into the ocean and did a dive and all that. And I thought the nuclear submarines are quite interesting. And it's a very interesting mix of 50-50 of, you know, very, very high-tech modern stuff and vintage World War II submarine movies. Uh, but in any case, you know, so I have the utmost respect for people that can do that job. And I'm sure you if you can do that, I'm sure you can do a master's uh, degree at USC. Uh, we don't have, um, we don't have courses specifically in the nuclear side of nuclear engineering. We have courses in fluid mechanics, heat transfer, thermal systems, you know, energy conversion, um, you know, many, many aspects related to nuclear engineering. But in terms of like nuclear reactor design or anything like that, we don't have those courses uh, specifically. One of our faculty, uh, Professor Satish Sadal, you know, at times has done that, but we found in recent years there just hasn't been enough demand for it for us to offer those classes. I mean, I wish we could, but like I say, and I think we could, I think Professor Sadal, you know, could teach the relevant courses, you know, if we had enough demand to fill up the classes. Great. Awesome. Uh, let's see. I think uh, another question here also related to military. It's great. Um, so for the MS Aerospace Engineering, does research require U.S. citizenship since some research might involve military work? Interesting question. Yeah. Do you know yeah. the answer to that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. A- absolutely not. Um, the thing is, I, we, I've even lost big grants in the past because they had, I guess you're probably familiar with this term, ITAR restrictions. I forget what ITAR stands for, but it basically is some sort of restriction that, um, that if you have a foreign student, you can only tell him or her, you know, about the science behind, but not the application, and then you have to keep all the documentation separate, and USC just won't do that. It's it's not even so much that it's so difficult to meet the ITAR restrictions, is that if you make a mistake and violate the rules that, uh, you know, you don't just get your wrist slapped, uh, you get, you know, very heavily fined for that. So anyway, I know that uh, both USC and Caltech, it was a joint project with Caltech, uh, we lost a big grant because neither university would sign a, a, a contract that had an ITAR restriction. So the bottom line is that's good for you because none of the research that we do is classified or even ITAR restricted, except under some very special circumstances. I guess, you know, I, I think there may be one or two cases where students uh, or, you know, where faculty have done ITAR restricted research, but it's very, very rare. And so almost entirely, uh, all of our research is completely open, and in fact, it kind of has to be because we're supposed to publish stuff. And if we don't publish, then what's what's our purpose then? And how can you tell students, you no, know, you can't talk about what you did? How do they go then and, and get a job uh, with that if they can't talk about the research that they did? So the bottom line is, uh, no, um, our work is almost entirely not classified or even ITAR restricted. Great, thank you. I actually just received, um, so ITAR is International Traffic and Arms Regulations, and it's a U.S. regulatory regime to restrict and control the export of defense and military-related technologies Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. safeguard U.S. national security. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, In addition, depending on the, depending on the, depending on the agency, they may take a very limited or very broad view of what is or isn't ITAR restricted. Great. All right, so let me see if there's anything else here. Thank you all so much for your questions. Um, and it looks like a lot of these um, I will be able to answer separately, but I think that there is one more additional 
I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but you know, how is the intellectual property handled while working for companies that we've signed non-disclosure agreements with? Not sure if you've oh, experienced yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, actually, in fact, I had one, um, one of my recent PhD students was, um, um, she was a full-time employee at uh, Aerospace Corporation, and there was some work that, you know, did involve uh, intellectual property. And so for that part, of the work, of course, I didn't, you know, discuss it with other students. You know, we signed the non-disclosure agreement, and we just discussed it privately. And you know, there were only like a couple. And then pretty soon, you know, they filed their patents on, you know, her ideas. And you know, then we could talk freely about uh, about that work. So there are a few cases where we do have uh, intellectual property, and sometimes, you know, we generate intellectual property in the course of our research. I have. You know, several of my patents, let's say I have about six or seven, and several of them, I would say maybe even the majority of them also have students as uh, co-authors, you know, of the patent. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're making a fortune. I mean, if you're not familiar with patents, you don't generally make money on patents. In fact, one of our former presidents of USC said, you never make money off of patents until someone infringes on them and then you sue them for infringement. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, just because you have patents, for, for academic people, uh, patents are not really a big deal. I mean, we have a few of those if we think we have some good idea that we might want to protect for possible future uh, rights. But more often, you know, our, our really our medal is judged based on the original research papers that we publish. But again, this intellectual property does come up, and yeah, we can deal with that, uh, um, you know, very routinely. Great, thank you so much for that insight. And um, so I think that wraps it up for us today. I know there, you may have some other questions as well um, from the audience, but um, I do want to mention that, you know, we will continue to answer these questions. Some, a lot of them are a little bit more individualized. So um, Megan and I will be able to answer those as well. But if you have any other questions after this session, I do encourage you to email us. Um, so if you are planning to pursue your program on USC's campus, you can email viterbi.gradadmission at usc.edu. Or if you're planning to pursue your program online via Denet Viterbi, den at And we're happy to set up phone calls with you. Um, but with that being said, you know, Professor Ronnie, I really want to thank you so much for your time, your insight, um, the very interesting responses um, to all the great questions out there. And thank you all for your patience, for having such fantastic questions. Um, we hope that you found the information session important and informative, and we hope to hear from you soon. But take care, and as we see at USC, fight on. Thank you for coming. <laughs>